Hi, everybody. Hi, it's nice to see your, see your friendly faces. Is there anybody here who's here for the first time? Cool, welcome. I'm glad that you're able to join us. So my name is Daniel. I'm a, uh, a student of Lama Yeshe Jimpa Rinpoche, who is the uh, co-founder and the spiritual director for the center, Lions Roar Dharma Center. So I, um, I've been studying with him for a few years now. I took refuge officially sort of um, two years ago, about two years ago. And so I'm relatively new to both Lama Jimpa and to Buddhist teachings in general. But Lama himself, he's been studying Buddhism for, I'd say, pretty much his whole life and has been teaching it for about 30-ish years, as far as I can tell. So he's been at it for a long time. And about eight years ago, um, some of Lama's teachers began recording his public teachings and uh, creating audio and video recordings of his teachings and making those um, available online. And so a lot of those teachings you can find actually on uh, YouTube and on SoundCloud, eight years worth of teachings. There's hundreds of these like precious gems that are out there available free publicly right now that you can download and make good use of. And I've spent actually a decent amount of time listening to those recordings. Um, and I've barely, barely scratched the surface of what's available. It's really pretty amazing. And I want to give a little shout out to all of the uh, volunteers and the, the members of, of Lions Roar who have made that possible. Um, it takes a, a small team of people to make sure that the recordings are all processed and put up online and taken care of. So. Uh, thanks to you guys for doing that. Um, so as I mentioned, the Lama has been teaching for a lot more than eight years. And so before those re uh, recordings started happening about eight years ago, um, his students were in fact taking notes at his talks um, and creating essentially sort of like written transcripts um, of those talks. And um, you know, it's it's interesting. As far as I'm aware, most of the older content hasn't, you know, it's not publicly available, it hasn't been digitized. And I mean, I have like this sneaking suspicion that there might even be like volumes of handwritten notes tucked away somewhere on a shelf gathering d dust, right? And and that, you know, in my experience, like my my worry there, I have this sort of fear that all of this vast wisdom is just sort of like um, eroding, going away, that is going to be hidden, it's going to be lost. And I really, really don't want that to happen. You know, I it makes me sad to think that so much time and effort went into creating that content in the first place, and then to not have it accessible to people who are interested in learning more. It just makes me sad. And so I, I have this dream where what I really want to do ultimately is I want to have like a a llama library, right? Where where it's not it's where it's everything, everything that's you know llama has ever said publicly, any notes people have taken, the videos, sound recordings, pictures, you name it, anything at all that's related to uh, llama jempa. I'd love to have that in the in like a central repository, like a little treasure chest for everybody um, to make good use of. Um. So I was talking about this idea with a dear friend of mine a while ago and was just, you know, just kind of riffing a bit. And they've been a, a student with Lama Jimpa for a lot longer than I have. And they actually had some of their own notes from talks from way back when. And I got an email that had a bunch of these notes in there, like, here you go, try that out, see what you think. And I was so excited. Um, I like I jumped right in, started looking around, like what is this? You know, what are these notes? It was amazing. It's so cool to sort of like get this glimpse into these old talks. And so, um, the talks are so. What I got was like notes from I'd say uh, several dozen talks from about to 2012 to 2017. Um, the majority of the talks, though, are like 2012, 2013, 2014. That's around the time frame of these notes that I got, this this little uh, data dump, as we might call it in the biz. And so what I did, as any sort of technological guy nowadays might do, is I dumped it into ChatGPT. I was like, yeah, 
hallelujah, this thing is going to, this is going to do it for me. Right. <laughs> and so I created what's known as a custom GPT where I put all the information in there and was like, all right, let's talk, you know, let's see if I can like actually get some of this information out of the notes. And it was helpful. I used it quite a lot, actually. Um, but I had a few different problems with it that made it so it, it couldn't quite like fulfill my fantasy of this llama library. Um, so a couple of the problems that I noticed with it is that you might have heard in terms of like AI language, this notion of hallucinations where the AI makes up a bunch of stuff on its own and kind of tries to convince you that it's right. Um, and if you've had any experience with AI, you, you've had this experience where you're like, man, that doesn't seem right, but it sure thinks it knows what it's talking about. And that was definitely my experience where there was uh, stuff in there that I was like, man, that's not, that doesn't resonate. It's not quite right. And to make matters worse, it absolutely refused to consistently give me references back to the original source material. So I, I couldn't tolerate that, right? Like, I want to know for a fact, what did Llama say, right? What does the source material say? And it's one thing to have an artificial intelligence telling you what he said, but I really wanted to check it out myself and be, you know, pointed to the original source material. And uh, ChatGPT just wouldn't do that um, consistently or, or accurately. So I wasn't like totally disappointed because I knew this is all new technology. It's coming along at a rapid pace. And voila, two months later, I think it was, it wasn't very long. In, 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 in AI terms, two months, of course, is a very, very long time. And so all kinds of things have developed since then. And I came across um, this tool, this really promising tool. It's an AI-powered research assistant that's made by Google. It's called Notebook LM. And so the way that it works is this. <laughs> yep, I see Dylan over there uh, giving the thumbs up. He's used it, I'm sure. Maybe a few of you have already used it. Maybe this will be somewhat old stuff, but I have a suspicion some people have not used have not used this tool. Right? So you've been on there, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the time. Well, so the way that Notebook LM works is sort of the way that I had wished and hoped that ChatGPT would have. So what you do, users upload documents, websites, videos, sound files, you name it. You just take the media and you put it into this tool. And then what happens is Notebook LM, as the tool is called, becomes an expert on that material on whatever it is that you upload. You can put anything you want in there and it becomes an expert on that. And then uh, the user, in this case me, can read, take notes and collaborate with this AI assistant in terms of like actually getting into the source material. It's amazing, it really is. Just that alone is fantastic. And it does the thing that ChatGPT refused to do for me, which was to point me back to the original source material so I could check it all out myself. Um, so that part's phenomenal, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so just, uh, I think it was like a month ago, I think it was last month, in fact, Notebook LM, um, the software developers created this option in the tool to create a podcast, to gen generate a podcast episode based on the source material. So as someone who creates podcasts and consumes a lot of podcasts, this got me kind of excited, right? I, it's mind-bending technology, truly. Um, the first time I experienced it, I couldn't believe that this was actually happening. And so, uh, you know, it's uh, this, this, feature is this podcast feature is literally, it's just like one little trick that this bigger AI research assistant has. It's just one, uh, one method of digesting the information and get making it more accessible. Um, but what I wanted to do was um, we're actually going to listen to one of these AI generated podcasts that's based upon the notes that I got from like the 2012 to 2017 talks. So it's sort of a high level overview of uh, Lama Rinpoche or Lama Jimpa's teachings rather. Um, and what I'm hoping is that we're gonna have a discussion afterward. So I feel a little bit like one of those, you know, the substitute teachers that's uh, shown up and is gonna play a video for the class, right? But just like one of those substitute uh, teachers might do like, I really want you to pay attention. 
No, okay, so what I'm looking for is I want some feedback. You can give it to me privately, but I'm hoping that you'll do it publicly. Bless you. Uh, and so uh, for, for anybody here who's been a student of Lama's for a long time, I want to know, like, is the podcast, does it, does it ring true? Does it seem like, does it seem accurate, right? How's the quality? Um, for people who are newer, I want to know whether any of the topics in the podcast that are covered by the podcast resonate with your own practice and with your own personal experience. So uh, the third thing, though, is sort of how does the technological lens that this is being offered through, how does it impact your own experience? So many people have, you know, positive relationships with technology. I feel that way, but I know that a lot of people don't. And so I want to know, I'm curious to hear, how do you actually feel about having artificial intelligence, you know, providing any type of spiritual insight, right? Um, especially based upon our precious teacher's teachings. So um, before we start the podcast, they're going to get it ready for us there in the back. I do want to offer this disclaimer from Google. I think it's pretty wise. Notebook LM may sometimes give inaccurate responses, so you may want to confirm any facts independently. And I couldn't agree more. That's the point of all of this. We need to confirm it for ourselves and not rely on anything that Daniel says or anything that an AI agent says. Okay, we still want to root, you know, root it all out and check it out for ourselves. So with that in mind, this so the podcast episode is kind of long. It's it's short for a podcast, but it's kind of long for a Dharma talk. It's about 11 minutes long. And like I said, please pay attention. Give me some feedback. I want to know how you relate to both the content and the technology. Okay. So we're diving deep into Lama Yesha Jinpa's approach to Vajrayana Buddhism. And wow, you weren't kidding when you said you had a stack of material talks, Q&As, even some study guides. It's impressive. It is. Someone's serious about going beyond Buddhism 101 here. Definitely not just dipping their toes in the Dharma pond with this one. That's for sure. And you know who loves that? Lama Jinpa. And making them work for us modern folks, like shockingly relatable. Totally. And with this much material to work with, we better make sure we pull out the nuggets that are really going to not get lost in the weeds here. Agreed. So where do we jump in with this treasure trove of wisdom? Well, he keeps coming back to this idea of the middle way. And it's not just some abstract concept. Oh, no. He makes it clear that this is how things work at Lion's Roar, you know, the center where he teaches. Right. So it's like the... Exactly. And he ties it into this struggle. I think a lot of us, particularly in the West, have this. Eli, it might be better just to play the wave file rather than a YouTube link. Will you try that? It generated the voices. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, what is it on an NPR, uh, one of the, is it Inskeep? So we're diving deep okay. in. Okay, go for it. Lama Yesha Jinpa's approach to Vajrayana Buddhism. And wow, you weren't kidding when you said you had a stack of material talks, Q&As, even some study guides. It's impressive. It is. Someone's serious about going beyond Buddhism 101 here. Definitely not just dipping their toes in the Dharma pond with this one. That's for sure. And you know who loves that? Lama Jimpa, he's all about taking these ancient practices and making them work for us modern folks. Like, shockingly relatable. Totally. And with this much material to work with, we better make sure we pull out the nuggets that are really going to make a difference for, you know, whoever's. Absolutely. Let's not get lost in the weeds here. Agreed. So where do we jump in with this treasure trove of wisdom? Well, he keeps coming back to this idea of the middle way. And it's not just some abstract concept. Oh, no, he makes it clear that this is how things work at Lion's Roar, you know, the center where he teaches. Right. So it's like the community itself is an embodiment of that balance. Yeah, exactly. And he ties it into this struggle. I think a lot of us, particularly in the West, have this... 
Ooh, yeah, that whole I should be enlightened by now pressure. Yes, like we're supposed to instantly transform into these perfect little Buddhas. I've so been there, like I should be meditating for hours, never getting annoyed, and probably levitating by now, right? Right, and Lama Jimpa calls us out on that. He's like this either approach the self-rejection or this expectation of complete overnight transformation it's missing the point okay so how do we find that middle ground then because that sounds kind of like a tightrope walk well he brings up something you might not expect the serenity prayer wait really you're talking about the accept the things you that's the one it's like he's saying the wisdom in that prayer is basically Technology giveth and it taketh away. Yeah, we want to make sure everybody can hear it. Wow. Either approach the self-rejection or this expectation of complete overnight transformation. It's missing the point. Okay, so how do we find that middle ground then? Because that sounds kind of like a tightrope walk. Well, he brings up something you might not expect, the serenity prayer. Wait, really? You're talking about the accept the things you cannot change one. That's the one. It's like he's saying the wisdom in that prayer is basically a microcosm of the entire path. Interesting, because we're not talking about self-rejection or becoming a completely different person. Exactly. It's yeah. both. We have to balance accepting where we're at right now, flaws, and all with the potential for growth. And that's what the path helps us do. So it's about showing up authentically, but also being open to change. And this applies not just to how we see ourselves, but even to how we approach all the different Buddhist traditions out there. Ah, yes, the Dharma shopping dilemma. It's so tempting, right? Yeah. Trying to find that perfect tradition, the right teacher, instead of actually committing to the work. Easier to keep trying new recipes than to actually, you know, cook anything. He uses that analogy, too. It's like constantly trying different bikes, but never actually riding one. You got to find one that fits, but then you got to pedal. And that brings us to this idea of Buddha nature, which he emphasizes is present in everyone. I love how he uses the analogy of gold hidden by tarnish, like even beneath our, you know, conditioned patterns and neurosis, that pure potential is always there. It's a powerful image, right? Like this inherent goodness that's just waiting to be uncovered. But he doesn't sugarcoat it. Oh, I bet. What does he say? He's clear that uncovering that gold, that Buddha nature, is active work. He even compares the Vajrayana path to, get this, boot camp. Boot camp. <laughs> okay, so much for a relaxing meditation retreat. Right. He's talking about confronting those really deep-seated patterns and this illusion we have of a solid, separate self. And that's where emptiness comes in. Which he sees as absolutely crucial, if I'm remembering right. 100%. He even critiques other meditation traditions for kind of sidestepping the whole who is doing the paying attention question. He's not afraid to challenge some assumptions. Not at all. He wants us to really investigate who we think we are, and it's not always comfortable, but that's where the real transformation begins. And this is where his approach to meditation gets really interesting because it's clear he's put a lot of thought into how to make this stuff work in our you know, crazy modern lives. He's all about practicality, right? 100%. Like, he says, forget closing your eyes unless you absolutely have to, because in real life, he says, you can't close your eyes. It's about developing that awareness, that clarity that we can access anywhere, not just on the meditation cushion. Exactly. And he gets surprisingly specific with the meditation instructions, too. Yeah, it's not just like, visualize a Buddha and you're good to go. Right. He's talking about having a clear, defined image, almost like a 3D hologram emanating light. It's about giving the mind something to really focus on something to come back to when it inevitably gets distracted. Which, let's be real, it always does. Always. But he's not dogmatic about it either. Like, he's open to combining traditional Shamatha Viparshana with other practices, even from different lineages. 
He even mentions Tonglin at one point. For anyone listening who doesn't know, that's that powerful Tibetan practice of sending and receiving compassion. And he seems totally cool with people blending practices, like creating their own unique tapestry of practice. I love that it's about finding what works for you, what helps you tap into that Buddha nature we were talking about. Exactly. Not just blindly following some rigid set of rules, but he's very clear about one thing, the importance of a teacher and Sangha, a community of practice. He even goes so far as to say, no cowboy Buddhists. One of my favorite Lama Jinpa quotes, he is not messing around with that one. Nope. No lone wolf enlightenment journeys allowed. So he sees that direct connection, that guidance as yeah. essential. He uses this really interesting phrase, spiritual dictator, yeah. to describe the role of the teacher. Oh, wow. Okay, that sounds intense. He's making a point that sometimes we need that push outside our comfort zones, you know, that challenge to our preconceived notions. So the teacher can see our potential even when we can't, and they're not afraid to use whatever means necessary to help us realize it. And to be fair, he also emphasizes that finding the right teacher is crucial. It's not about blindly following anyone who calls themselves a guru. It's like, don't just spill all your deepest secrets to a therapist without checking their credentials first. Exactly. You want to make sure you're putting your trust in the right hands, but once you have that trust, that connection... It can be incredibly transformative. Totally. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about the formal practice, the meditation, the teachings, you know. It's about bringing that awareness into literally every aspect of life, right? Mm -hmm. 100%. And this is where Lama Jinpa's down-to-earth style really shines. He doesn't shy away from the messiness of it all. Like he's the first to admit he gets frustrated sometimes. Exactly. Even the Dalai Lama gets annoyed. He says these things are part of being human. It's not about becoming some emotionless robot. Definitely not. Mm -hmm. It's about learning to work with those emotions to navigate the challenges with more awareness and compassion. So refreshing to hear that kind of honesty. He's basically saying, yeah, life is messy. You're going to get cut off in traffic. Your kids are going to have meltdowns. You're going to burn dinner. Okay, now you're just speaking my soul. Hmm. But seriously, how do we actually apply these teachings when we're in the thick of it? You know, when we're feeling anything but enlightened. He uses this great surfing analogy. We don't try to stop the waves of emotion. We learn to ride them. Exactly, and hopefully not get completely wiped out in the process. He talks a lot about this idea of right effort. Finding that sweet spot between pushing too hard and being complacent. Exactly, and he loves that saying, the turtle wins the race. Slow and steady wins the enlightenment game. Right, it's about consistency, not perfection. Showing up for our practice even when we don't feel like it. Because, let's be real, some days the couch and a bag of chips are just way more appealing than the meditation cushion. He gets that. He's not asking us to be superhuman just to bring that same awareness, that same kindness to those moments of struggle that we do, to the moments of peace and insight. So it's all Dharma practice, whether we're nailing our meditation or burning dinner. It really is. It's about recognizing that every moment, every experience is an opportunity for growth, for deepening our understanding, for uncovering that Buddha nature that's always there even in the midst of the chaos especially in the chaos and that's where his vision for community comes in this idea of creating a space where people can support each other on this you know messy beautiful path totally and it's more than just you know having a meditation hall or whatever right gotta be more than just a building it's about creating a dharma home and you can just feel the intention he's putting behind that it makes you want to book a flight to Sacramento and just be a part of it. Right. He talks about wanting to see lions roar, like bustling with activity, visiting llamas, different teachings for different levels, social gatherings, festivals even. Wait, did he really just say festivals? What does it even look like? I know, right? It sounds kind of amazing. He even mentions biscotti making at one point. Okay, now I'm just picturing Lama Jimpa in an apron whipping up a batch of biscotti with a bunch of students. That's hilarious. <laughs> it really speaks to that down-to-earth, joyful approach he brings to this stuff, but it's not all, you know, fun and biscotti. Right, this is still Vajrayana Buddhism we're talking about. Exactly. He's not shying away from the challenges, the hard work that goes into this path. It's boob camp with biscotti. Exactly. And speaking of the path, we've talked a lot about the destination, you know, enlightenment, liberation, all that. Good stuff. Right, but what I'm really appreciating is this emphasis on how we actually navigate the journey itself, you know? Bumps along the road. Yes. The inevitable doubts, the days when meditation feels impossible. How does Lama Jimpa address that part of it? Because, let's be real, that's where most of us live. Right, and it all comes back to that idea of right effort, that balance we were talking about. He's really emphasizing that those challenges, those moments when we fall short, 
They're not failures. They're part of the process. The obstacles, the path. Exactly. He'd probably say those cookie dough instead of meditation cushion days. Those are the moments when the real practice kicks in. Because it's easy to be spiritual when everything's going smoothly right. Totally. It's how we show up in those messier moments that actually matters. It's like bringing that same awareness, that same kindness we're trying to cultivate on the cushion into those moments of frustration, impatience, even anger. Exactly. That's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And that's where having that supportive community, that Dharma home, can make all the difference. He's so clear about that this isn't a solo journey. We need each other, especially when those doubts and challenges inevitably pop up. So taking all of this in the middle way, this idea of uncovering our Buddha nature, the practical meditation instructions, and this emphasis on community, what would you say is the most important thing for someone to remember if they really want to bring Lama Jimpa's teachings to life in their own experience? It might sound a little counterintuitive, but I think it's the permission he gives us to be fully human, you know? To not have it all figured out. Exactly. To embrace our imperfections while we're also, you know, doing the work on the path. He's not selling some idealized version of Buddhism. And that's what makes it so real, so relatable. Exactly. It's like he's that wise, compassionate friend who sees our potential even when we can't see it ourselves. And he's not afraid to call us out on our BS, but he's also going to laugh with us, you know? He's not going to let us take ourselves too seriously. Exactly. And hey, maybe if we're lucky, he'll even share that biscotti recipe. That's what I'm talking about. But until then, may your journey be filled with all of it, the challenges, the joys, the messiness, and may you uncover that Buddha nature one imperfect step at a time. Thanks, tech guys. <laughs> nice work. <clears throat> All right, guys. So let's keep the mic out because I want to hear, get some feedback. I want to talk about this and it's okay. It's totally fine if the conversation meanders a little bit. Just let's all make sure that we're talking into a mic so that everybody here can hear us, everybody on Zoom can hear us, and all future intelligences that are listening to this recording will also hear us, okay? So um, I do have myself, I, I'm not relying 100% on you to carry the rest of this, but I'm hoping that I'll get some of this feedback. I do have some quotes and some interesting commentary on the topics that were presented in the podcast. Um, where what I did is I listened to the podcast and I went back on some of the things that kind of caught my ear, you know, like, well, what did they, you know, what exactly did he mean by spiritual dictator, you know, like that kind of thing and went back and checked the sources and then made a few notes here. So I do have some stuff to share there, but I do want to hear from you first. Well, since I have the mic, I'll start. I, I really enjoyed it. And I, uh, found their, the sound of their voice is really pleasant and the uh, um the tempo and inflection very realistic so that was fun i mean i do think that they were maybe a little too polished like their ability to go back and forth is without compare um i i think it it maybe didn't deep dive quite as much as i wanted it to in terms of those specific topics like you were talking about like what what is a spiritual dictator how does that apply to my practice so I'm wondering, um, I did find it really informative and to hit on a lot of important points. Um, but is there a way to get it more confined to subject so that it can go deeper? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Matthew. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. This was really a demonstration of some just the cool sort of tech, and it was meant to be an overview. Um, but you can deep dive a little. So those podcasts are actually, I think, called deep dives. Um, but the way that it works is either you create a container with just the, the subject matter that you're interested in. So you can isolate the content itself. But just last week, I think it was, um, the Google developers made it so that you can give it instructions on how, like what, what you want it to focus on. And so, in fact, yes, the answer is you can make it talk about incredibly specific stuff. Yeah. And I, too, find the voice inflection and all of that kind of mind-bending. You're right. It's a little bit too good. It has that uncanny valley feeling to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's weird to realize that those voices, that's not like some NPR host, right? That's just a computer making, making the sounds. 
Yeah, that's so did the computer review all these nuggets and then hold on. We, we, we need to use the mic, Miguel. I do have a follow up question though. Um, I'm wondering if you can ask it what topics it has the capability to deep dive on so that you have like a list of what you can choose from. Yeah, so so what I wanna point out about this is the goal of this Llama library is not just to have like a repository, but to have this research assistant to sort of help you pull, pull the information out of it, right? And so the podcast part of it is just one clever little trick. It's just a neat gimmick, right? The real brunt of the tool, the real value in the tool is still text-based, and you can ask it any question about anything in the material and it will respond. It'll tell you what it can and can't talk about. In some cases, for example, I would say, you know, give me quotes from Lama Jimpa about um, the importance of having a physical building for the temple or something like that. Um, and it would say, oh, he, actually, I can't find anything in the notes talking about that specifically, so I can't address that. So that's what's nice about it is instead of like ChatGPT, it just makes stuff. It'll just tell you something, right? It'll give you, so ChatGPT would give you quotes from Lama Jimpa that he never said. You know, this, this tool doesn't do that. So it, it does appear to know its own limitations when it comes to the subject matter. Um, although it doesn't, it's not a, it's not like sometimes it should, like, I feel like it should know something, but it doesn't know, but I'd rather have it that way. That's okay. Cause that's more like me. Yes, Miguel. So As you can see, I am very technically challenged, and I guess that's why I found those voices uh, creepy. I, I am wondering, okay, I know very little about artificial intelligence. Um, did the computer take all these nuggets? I think I would rather hear the nuggets than uh, some artificial voices talking about them. But did the computer review all these nuggets and then uh, put it, talk to itself to present something to more humans? Yeah. Yes. That's exactly what happened, right? It took the, whatever source material that I put in there. In this case, there were literally just notes that a student took from Lama's talks back in the day. And they were excellent notes. Don't get me wrong. They were very well crafted notes, but that's all it was working with. If it has video or if it has anything else, then it will reference that as well, right? It can it can listen to a recording, at, transcribe it, and then pull information out of that transcription. It's, it's pretty darn amazing. And I agree with you, Miguel, that I actually feel the same way that I'm not, I want to know what Lama said, Yeah. right? I want to know that, I want to hear the teaching itself. The problem is this, this is kind of the, the thing that I'm hoping we can resolve with the use of technology is that right now, if you want to make use of those recordings, for example, hundreds of recordings, audio and video recordings, you have to listen to the whole thing, right? You yourself have to pay attention to the whole talk. And then hopefully you're doing what the AI is doing and you're making little notes and all of that and you're studying it. But it's really hard to sort of like take a deep dive into a particular topic if that topic is covered over 20 or 30 different talks, right? Because you might, that's 20 or 30 hours that you have to then spend, you know, researching it in order to, to get at some, some answers. So what I like about this, both the podcast part of it, but also just the tool itself, the text part of the tool, is that it piques my interest, you know, like there'll be some topic that it brings up. And then it like, like the spiritual dictator is, a, is just a good one. That one grabbed my ear for some reason. And the boot camp one as well. I was like, well, what's, what did he actually say? You know, like I can't quite imagine Lama saying that he was a spiritual dictator, but then I could kind of imagine it. And then I went back and like saw what was actually written down, what he actually said. Right. And that I find really helpful. This is a tool to guide us back to the original source material rather than something aimed to replace it. 
Right? I wouldn't want to replace it. Brave new world. Brave new world, indeed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And keep in mind, we're not just talking about the technology, right? Like, I'm I'm keen to hear your thoughts on any of the content it presented. You know, you're talking about the original source material, and it's not. You know, those notes are not the original source material, and I think we need to be, somehow or another, that would have to be um, part of the disclaimer when you know you're not work I mean if you're working with the you know the videos that are on YouTube that are Lama's talks, that's the original source material. And I can see the great benefit of compiling 20 hours worth of, of talks when I'm looking for a specific subject or a couple of subjects and it'll pull those subjects out of all of those talks. That I'm comfortable with. But I'm not so comfortable with other people's interpretations of what it is they think they heard. And Agreed. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a hundred percent with you on that. I, I think that so when I say source material, I'm saying source material for this engine, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, that. but I you're absolutely it I think we have to be careful not just with, you know, which material goes in to the machine. Um you know, well, actually, I want to point something out. Uh, so you guys heard when in the podcast, they were talking about Buddha nature as tarnished gold. Okay. Old story. Right. Old story. You can imagine any number of different teachers saying that. Lama Jimpa did not say that in any of the talks that um, that I upload, any of the notes. What happened was I, I accidentally included notes from a talk with Geshe Tashi, where he was talking about Buddha nature. The machine, because it thought that everything was from Lama Jimpa, attributed it to Lama Jimpa. It was Geshe Tashi who said that, right? And who used that, that analogy or that metaphor. Um, so the quality of the information going in is really important. The other aspect that I think is really critical for anybody who's you know listening to recordings from back in the day or reading notes or any of that is that that information was presented to certain people within the context you know of a there was he knew who he was talking to right and had a direct personal relationship with the majority of those people and so contextually we might pull something out. And, and get some kind of meaning that wasn't intended, you know, either because the AI tells us something, it makes something up, or because we think we understand what's being said because it's been digested and spit up for us, right? That's why I think it's really important to try to get as close to the source as possible. Ideally, it would be an actual talk where you can see and hear Lama Jimpa talking. We used to call that garbage in, garbage out. Yes, garbage in, garbage out is what Susan said. And yes, that's true. That's exactly the way that this machine works. If you give it garbage, it'll give you garbage back. Um, thank you for your talk, Dan. Whoa, this is overwhelming. <laughs> thank you for your talk. And I was going to, um, I was thinking of the same thing. The talk was given for during a time, a place, and to an audience. You covered that. The other thing that I was thinking was that, um, you know, you listen to a talk, you kind of take it home, you kind of work with it, you think about it, you meditate. And uh, it seems like that's an important part of the process to really feel like you have some understanding. And so even though there's this kind of shortcut to kind of distill it all into this really kind of refined um, way, it, uh, it seems like the effort there's effort that needs to take place to really feel like you um you get the material you know deep inside um you know it, there was a lot of content there it felt like you know it was like i mean there were exactly and so my my feeling is it needs to be spread out it needs to be digested and um and then it needs to need, you need to come up with your your own kind of feeling of understanding of it so thanks. Yeah, no, that's that's excellent. In fact, you know, in these notes that I had, Lama Jimpa talks about that extensively um, in giving instructions about the need to marry study with meditation, right? It's a common theme in his teachings and that it's important to, you know, not, uh, what does he say? Don't read more than you meditate, right? But it, the, the two need to be brought together in balance. 
And so if we were to use this tool to sort of gain what we think is intellectual understanding um, of what Lama Jimpa is trying to say, I think we're sort of missing the point. You heard them say that this is a yogic school or a yogic style of training, which is, you know, personal instruction and the relationship with the teacher and with the Sangha are pivotal. They're absolutely critical to this particular path. And so anything that, you know, if you were to read something or hear an AI machine say something, whatever, yeah, reflect on that. See how that that sits with you and then take it to the teacher, right? Talk to them. Hey, what did you mean when you said X, Y, and Z, you know? And I think that that would be really helpful. That'd be a good way to use it. But I think just taking it at a superficial surface level and just assuming like, oh, just because you heard a podcast, you know, about something Lama said years ago that you somehow know what he meant by that. I think that would, that'd be silly, right? But I think it's more like a tool to bring it, like, it's like a, it's a way, it's just another way to digest it and to present the information. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a surface presentation. This one in particular, it is possible to generate quite complex, detailed um, dives down particular rabbit holes with these tools. But the, I think that your caution and your suggestions to really sit with it and explore it further are they're important, no matter if, whether it's superficial or a deep dive. Uh, Ellen, what do you have to say? Hi, thanks. I loved it. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, I had a couple pieces of feedback, and one was the one that Susan raised, and then Brad sort of seconded that we don't know, you know, exactly what happened between what Lama said and the note taker. And I know when I take notes on talks, I write down what's meaningful to me, and it might not even be exactly what Lama Jimpa said. You know, and I, I think if there's a lesson for me in this, I do this sometimes when I'm taking notes. If he actually says something and I actually write it down, put it in quotes, you know, because you never know if these written notes can be useful to somebody. And hopefully the AI engine can recognize a direct quote more than just sort of our own little insights from the talk. But I thought it was pretty cool. Um, I, I would be interested in exploring whether there is some sort of PR use for this for Lama Jimpa and Lion's Roar because I mean it's kind of flashy and sometimes we do want to put out kind of flashy things so I don't know I mean we have to balance that with the the discipline and the meditation and direct conveyance from Lama and that sort of thing um, I guess the other thing I'll say is I would and this is a little off, off topic of your questions I was incredibly touched by how much of Lama Jimpa's vision that was sort of fantasy presented as fantasy in those recordings or those notes has come to fruition. Oh my gosh. I mean, we have a building, we have a song, we have festivals, we have music. I don't know if we made this God, we've made a lot of stuff. And that to me is pretty cool to just have that little uh, time capsule and see where we are now. So I enjoyed that a lot too. So thank you. I think this is fantastic. There's so many uses. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so much, Ellen. I really appreciate that feedback. And I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. It was really quite fascinating. I ha I've only been here since the temple was around, right? These The notes from these talks are from when the... Uh... So the temple, Susan was just saying, we got the, the actual building in 2015. Right. So this is when the Lions Roar uh, community was meeting at the Quakers meeting house. It's actually, it's in the note, like it's, the notes are pretty good that way. In this case, the person who took the notes, I, I thought actually when I first got them, I w could have sworn that they were transcripts because they were so detailed and so like very clearly like you could, as Ellen said, you know, like if you, I, I pity the fool that has to like understand my notes you know, my scribbles, you know, like bear, I can barely understand them. But the person who took these notes did an inscrutable job. And you can actually tell when looking at it, you can be like, oh, yeah, no, that's where Lama's actually taught. That's those are his words, you know, as opposed to just little notes. So, um, and yeah, I don't know about the public. Uh, I had one other tech question. Go for it. Sorry. I had one other uh, tech question. 
can you detune certain things like the 100% was said probably a dozen times, you know, the, I agree 100%. Can you detune some of those, uh, you know, social colloquialisms in these talks? Ellen, it just made this thing like last week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, but I will I will speak to that a little bit. Yes, I, it does seem like the people who are creating this podcast tool understand the need to modify it. So um, a uh, you kind of like what Matthew was pointing to, you can give it now, actually, when it first started, it would just make a podcast and you had no control. Now you can give it specific instructions on what you want it to cover, what you don't want it to cover. And apparently you can request that it use different voices and styles, but I don't it's not there uh, yet next week okay cool it was cool thank you and you were going to yeah. maybe respond to the the pr bit so if you have something i'm yeah. sorry to cut you off no i i don't have anything else to say about the pr bit other than that i agree that um it is possible one of the cool uses of this kind of technology is to basically take it as you saw just now and package it up in all of these different ways right the kind of media that can be generated like by this kind of tool is intense right our whole world is going to be flooded with it if it isn't already so you know i i think that um there's some value there probably in the in the public relations aspect but i do i do want to say that i i also found it incredibly moving to see the strength and the clarity of rinpoche's intention and knowing seeing like he he knew, he could see this place before we had it which was it was wild to me you know to actually be able to cuz i'm i'm here the beneficiary of the temple the building it's already here this is all i've ever known right and to go back and to see him you know talking to the community about and what we need is we need space right i like this but what we really want is a place for us all to come together you know and you know you 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 may have heard uh, rinpoche say that he um, absolutely does not want this to become a dharma club right we've heard him say that in any number of different ways but what i did like now he has not used the phrase dharma home the podcasters made that up, but but I liked it because that's the way it feels to me. You know, it feels like a Dharma home. So really, really cool. All right. More feedback. Anybody? Anybody? Susan? The mic is hiding. Anybody see a mic laying around? It's, it's, I just I just want to say that Jeff said your aspiration to do this is Really oh, I need to hear that though, really loud and clear. Find the mic. I think your aspiration to do this job, to do this work of compiling this Lama archive or whatever it will be called, um, the Yeshi archive. I know that we've already got that. Um, that's from Lama Yeshi, but. Um, it's it's really really I think going to be beneficial to the sangha and to Buddhism in general. Um, I think and to Sacramento. I th I think this is really really your aspiration is huge and um, anything that we can do to support you in doing this and and anybody I presume that eventually you might have a cadre of people working on this i don't know i mean there are other people who have your level of technological um curiosity yeah. you know? i appreciate that susan so, yeah i i don't know what's to come of all of this all i know is that i've there's so much information already out there that i like i find it amazing when i was first studying here I remember coming across the SoundCloud recordings. Like nobody had told me they were there. I just was hunting around and I came across them. And I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. I heard all of these wonderful teachings, you know, but they're like, they're hidden. No, no one's listening. No one's going to SoundCloud and downloading a file and listening to it, you know? So I, I think that um, being able to sort of make it more accessible is definitely a, a dream of mine because I, I benefited so much from it, you know, and I do, I have this technological curiosity. This is not, this is child's play though, to do what 
what we just heard and what this is what's happening here the hard work wasn't done by me literally somebody else llama had to give the talk somebody else had to record the talk uh and then you know all i'm doing is putting it into a machine somebody somebody else made the machine you know so i'm just feeding it but um it, it i i think it has a lot of potential and you know if i what you you said you know is there's anything that we in the community can do to support the project um i want as much material as I can get. So what I have, so the more content, the better. Um, so if you have anything, if you have notes, if you know of somebody who has transcripts, whatever, any of that, um, as you said yourself, Susan, the higher quality information is better. So one of the things that's problematic about, you can just feed a, a like I could take all of Llama's YouTube videos and just drop it right in there directly. And it'll do a pretty good job. Where it kind of messes up, I think, is in the flow, like recognizing who is speaking when. And because there are there's a lot of um, uh, specific language here that the AI doesn't necessarily pick up on. So it, it might not recognize terms like uh, bodhicitta, for example. Yeah, bodhicitta is a hard one for it. You know, you heard even with shamatha vipassana, it couldn't, it didn't quite read it right. You know, and so I think that having higher quality transcripts um, of the talks of the actual what was said, who said it, um, that's super helpful. So um, and then, yeah, ultimately, you know, um, uh, what I really want is Rinpoche's blessing for it as well. Right. And for him to check it out and say, yes, this is helpful. These are some guardrails that we need in it. And then to make it more accessible, you know. I, so I do this podcast um, with my friend Jack on a weekly basis where we talk about the intersection of Buddhism and daily life. It's called uh, Talk Openly. And one of the things, one of the ways that I've used these tools is um, to prepare for those. So we have any number of different subjects come up. We talk about all kinds of things, right? And whatever the topic is for that week, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go and consult with these, these tools, just like this one. And so, for example, I'll, I have a whole a similar tool that's set up for, has a ton of um, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's teachings, right? And it does the same kind of thing. And so what I like to do is I like to kind of like see the different flavor that each teacher presents on a subject, right? So I'll go in, I'll be like, all right, what did, you know, what did Lama Jimpa say? All right, what did Trungpa say? And so you kind of get different facets of the same topic from different teachers, so we can use these in conjunction. We don't have to be, it doesn't have to be so isolated. So siloed. Yeah. So the data, the siloing of the data is helpful to, you know, to, to know what you're working with, but it's good to, to then check multiple silos, so to speak. Yeah. Doug has something to say. Okay. Just a couple of things. I wonder if you could like change the format instead of like, podcast of two people would be like one person saying something and asking for questions <laughs> um you know i it's it's fantastic that you asked the question so on the one hand yes they are the the it sure looks like the direction they're headed is to be able to change the voices the format and some of the like characteristics or mannerisms of the podcast hosts mm -hmm. so it seems like that's the direction that they're headed if anybody here has played with um, ChatGPT, it does have an advanced voice mode that I've used for this kind of thing as well, which is absolutely mind numbing. So where you can have a conversation, like a, a verbal conversation with the tool. So it's not quite the same. I would say it's not the same, for example, as talking to Llama, <laughs> right? Uh, but it can be really helpful because um, being able to just talk and get a response and, and you know, this call and response aspect to it is helpful. So, um, yes, that technology exists. It's not all married together yet. So what you want isn't here now. But again, give it a week or two. It'll be here. Another thing is, could you blend uh, the AI with an actual recording? Like and this is what Lomo said on this subject. <laughs> it it does that somewhat already, you know, where you can so whenever it's quoting a source some source material, you can just click it and it takes you to it. It doesn't blend it natively, you know. But you know, if you wanted to hear 
Lama saying whatever it was that he said, you would just click the little button and it takes you to that part of the video where he's talking about it. Yeah. That's, it's really helpful, really helpful to be, to, to get exactly at the material that you want. Yeah. Uh, well, well, the or the transcribing is actual his actual words, so it's a little more to the point, and there's nothing else in between. Although we do take things out that are like ums and uh, like that and things like that. Yeah. I uh, so transcript written uh, that's what i was trying to get at is written transcripts that have been cleared up by a student or by lama jimpa himself where it's very clear that this isn't it's high fidelity text is best as far as i'm concerned so if we really wanted to use this tool we would be using those kinds of high quality transcripts rather than ai generated transcripts or just notes sue you had something to say First of all, I want to thank you, Daniel. I think this is an amazing project. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm speaking from the technological cave woman. And so I wanted you to hear from that. Those of us who are uh, definitely not in this ballpark, because I think uh, the idea that you're trying to do is, is wonderful. And I also think the way it was presented, um, it kind of freaks me out, like Miguel. But uh, I think it, it made uh, sense to me and it was acceptable to me, the presentation and the way it was presented. I got a little tired of the comments back and forth and I was going, well, where's the meat of this? You know, um, where am I learning from this? And I felt I really didn't get that. It was kind of like a nice little overview about Lama and maybe might make people interested in checking it out, which I think is a good thing. But um, I want to say that the, the, the portion of us in the cave think that it uh, can be useful as long as garbage doesn't go in. It's yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. I know that you're sort of a Luddite. You know? yes. <laughs> well, let's not go too far. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but yeah. And I, I go in the cave. I, pre I appreciate that, sir. I really do. I think the danger is um, what goes in and, and how people may people who don't know, who aren't part of the Sangha, may interpret what they hear um, and, and not really have it in context. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That's the part. So when I heard the podcast myself, I there were a few things in there. I was like, like I mentioned, this, the spiritual dictator, the boot camp, where I was like, ah, that could be interpreted in certain ways that aren't necessarily beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the person's desire to actually understand and needing to go back to the original mm -hmm. source material is helpful. Yeah. That's the thing, of course, my greatest fear is how people use this wonderful technology. Yeah. And, and how can we prevent the uh, wrongful use of it or interpretation that is not helpful to the person or to our Sangha or to Lama? Right. So, Right. Well, I think that it's sort of like Lama tells us about Vajrayana practice itself, right? Is it's powerful energy. He likens it to like nuclear energy and that it has to be handled with care and under proper guidance by somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> so I'm hoping that these tools, uh, I can get, the, get it all together in such a way that we can get feedback from Rinpoche himself about the tools good ways to use it, less than helpful ways to use it, um, because then I think that we can we can really make it more generally available. Well, thank you so much yeah, again for you. all your work. I appreciate it. I think Andrew has a question in the back. Um, I'm noticing, um, honestly, um, some aversion and I'm kind of sitting with that and trying to kind of move through that. Um, I think this is a great conversation because you, you're as AI, you've unlocked something really powerful here that has great positive potential. Um, 
but we have to shepherd it and guide it and put guardrails on it for sure. Um, so I was thinking about, for example, and I love like what Bradley and Susan and Sue said about like, you know, making sure it goes in the right direction. And, and Susan in particular talked about disclaimers. And one of them that I think is, okay, so I'll get to the disclaimer, but when I go to a talk by Lama, you know, I assume I'm not the only one who doesn't understand 100% of what he's saying. Um, and he has talked at some point about it being um, a transmission. He's giving a pith instruction, and, and it's, he's not really talking to our intellectual side. And um, so, and then kind of sidebar that relates, um, you know, as someone who works in the mental health field, um, there's a huge need for mental health help and not enough supply. And so there's opportunities for people to get help through apps and um, online stuff, right? And, and AI can be a pseudo therapist. Um, and yet, you know, there's something about that that person to person heart connection that will never be created by AI that you just don't get. And we, we have it too, like some of us, I'm assuming almost all of us at some point have attended this online and we get a lot of it, but I always get more when I'm here. So there's just something about that kind of that being with Sangha in person like that. And so, um, I guess one concern I might have is if someone would say, wow, well, I can, I can get what I need to out of Lama Jempa by just doing, listening to, to, I can plug in what I want to know about. It's kind of like I can read Trump or Rinpoche. I'll never see him, but I can just go read about him. Uh, so then does Lama Jempa become another ghostly figure to that person who gives them, they can start cherry picking what they want out of of that instead of the experience of Lama and also the experience of Sangha. So um, you can't replace a therapist. You can't replace a Lama with, you know, the digitized versions of Lama, if that makes sense. And so some kind of disclaimer that, um, you know, you, to, to get the true essence of the teachings, you have to be present like that, you know, so that someone doesn't think, oh, I, I don't really have to do that hard work to drive down there and then sit and that sort of thing. 100% what you said. It would be hard if you were uh, paying attention to Lama Jimpa's teachings, even through um, an AI tool like this, it would be very hard to miss the point that you just made because he himself makes that point repeatedly, right? That there's, he's not anti-technology. He's not against Zoom or books, right? Um, but that there's a degree of fidelity in terms of the transmission that happens based upon how close you are, right? Like, so when we meet with him one-on-one -on -one in Darshan, that's like, that's you couldn't get better than that, right? Like, here's your teacher right now talking to you about your situation. It doesn't get better than that as far as I'm concerned, okay? Then you can come to a, a public talk and you might feel like he's talking to you, but he's talking to everybody who's who's present, right? Um, and then you might read a book by him, right? Or you might read someone's notes about a talk that he gave. It it kind of degrades, right? The qu the quality of the transmission could degrade, I think. Um, and I think your concern is a valid one, um, that there have to be some type of it's not just disclaimers, but like it, it's almost like the tool needs to be aware when um, something needs to, like where maybe like some guidance might be needed where you say, hey, the tool says, you're asking a question. This is, these are the things that Lama Jimpa might have said about that. But really, you, come on, you should go and talk to him, right? Or go talk to a qualified teacher about what you just learned. So, yeah, they did invite us to catch a plane and come here. Um, there is a, I, I use a, um, a custom GPT to, to sometimes um, access information by um, other, other teachers. 
and they what's nice about chat gpt is that it that at least the ones that i've played around with they do in fact do that they'll say ah you know here's here's some feedback on what you just asked me but you need to go talk to a teacher and it, that's part of it right like the, that that if this is based upon the teachings and the teachings involve uh, having a personal relationship with a teacher and a sangha then how I mean, you'd have to be pretty ignorant to just say well I don't need that, right? But then again, you know, we all have that terminal uniqueness that Lama talks about, right? So, oh, I'm special. I can somehow get all of this without having to deal with a messy sangha and people and and teachers that make me uncomfortable and bearing my soul. Oh, I don't need to do all of that. I just need to listen to this AI, right? I mean, sure, somebody could do that, but that kind of a person, a person who's likely to do that would most likely, you know, I think... Um, either not approach the teachings in the first place or would be similarly misguided on their own. You may you may have a how oh, you said the Lama Jimpa is not against books. But I bet when the printing press was developed, there was a lot of people that were really scared of all these books that were going to be out there. Oh yeah. New technologies always they're scary. I agree. I'm scared of them too. I, I I had to hear Andrew's comment before I realized what was wrong for me with some of the chat GPT. And it was because when Lam was talking, we're talking about quite often very sacred subjects. He pauses for you to process. This was like entertainment tonight. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> it, was, it felt commercialized. Yeah. So I, I think maybe that's what Andrew's speaking to, that it's... Um, it's not the same. It's good. It's helpful. Yeah. It's just not, it's not the same. I agree. It's an echo. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would, I mean, to, I, I think to Andrew's point, we would be very clear that nothing generated by the AI is a teaching, right? Per se, it's pointing you towards teachings and encouraging you to talk to a teacher but I don't think that they should be considered teachings. Yeah, it needs to be, the, the tool itself needs to be clear so that people don't have misunderstandings. I think Elizabeth Zima has maybe something to say. Yeah, I've got a couple things to say. Uh, one, I think you could use with the SoundCloud recordings, you could use AI to summarize what was in the recording itself so people could use it as an educational tool and i wonder if it would be more of more value to build a wiki of some sort with uh lama jimpa's uh words and ideas uh that could be and i know this is text based and backwards but could be uh checked and looked at and used as um, uh, something that's educational. The other thing is, I think it would be more interesting if you built a deep fake uh, podcast of the uh, Sangha voices and Sangha people speaking um, that would be more interesting to me uh, with an emphasis on what audience you're speaking to at the time. And there may be a way you can do that um, that would make it a little a little more of value because uh, dipping your toes into the Dharma pond and shockingly relatable uh, made me burp. <laughs> um, I thought this was really interesting. I'm fairly excited about it. And uh, one thing you need to know is there are recordings of Lama Jimpa's teacher giving teachings that are floating around there. They need to be translated. And um, uh, but a transcript of those, if the AI could take that, translate it and give a transcript, that would be interesting as well. I like your ideas, um, especially the deep bake of the voices. Uh, that's kind of fun. 
you know, what that means is that we take, um, let's just say we, we do have a lot of recordings of Lama Jimpa. So it's actually relatively easy nowadays to create, um, to clone like his voice. And so then you could actually have a podcast where, for example, it's Lama talking to Patty, you know, and the two of them are going back and forth like this, and then maybe have some instructions to avoid, uh, avoid particularly obnoxious language like they they kind of tended to use in there. Yeah, I I mean I I I hear you, and I think that you know your point about SoundCloud and using AI to summarize it that's already here. I mean that's already part and parcel of. Um, what like this tool and other tools do. I'm just trying to, I, what I'm aiming for, what I really want is high, high quality information going in. And unfortunately, AI transcripts and AI analysis of those transcripts is kind of poor. Well, they're not human. They're not human. And you can really Great. tell that these people have no experience with the Dharma at all. And they're not people. Able- yeah, they're not people, and see that's the that's the issue. So I mean, they just the, just the thought of a machine imag- that's never seen Lama Jimpa imagining him wearing an apron and cooking biscotti, right? Yes. Right, like that's not that's not real. So, but that again, you know, my my point in sharing the podcast, it that's a clever trick, you know, and it can be something that's useful. That format can be useful for people to learn more, um, but that's not. That's not even what I'm after. The tool itself that points us back to original teachings and helps us to research them and get back to what Lama actually said, that's what I want. And that's already there. I just need, like I said, higher quality going in and some guidelines, disclaimers, that type of thing. Um, but it's coming along. It's coming along well. And I really appreciate everybody's feedback. I um, I had a ton of notes in here that had nothing to do with technology. I thought it was rather interesting that this turned into a tech a conversation. I mean, I'm not surprised, but um, there were some things that were said in there that I wanted to dive into, and maybe we can do, maybe we can do that at the next talk, and we can avoid having uh, generic AI voices talk, and we can just have a human to human conversation about the stuff. Um, I think that's probably good for now. Patty has something to say. So um, thank you, Daniel, for uh, this idea. To, like every, like others have already told you, to put together the teachings in a way that everyone can hear them for the future. But um, I just wanted to uh, say that um, you know, in our tradition, the heart mind is, I think, would it should be quite emphasized in the presentation of this um, library because the heart mind is the mind that we emphasize. And like uh, you were mentioning how the um, AI doesn't recognize words like bodhicitta that is such an important word. So, I mean, just those kind of things that we know in advance that it doesn't recognize that are so important. I think if we could introduce it in that way, it might be more palatable to people knowing that we are fully aware that it can't replace the heart mind and that there's some language that it doesn't recognize yet. That That's what I just wanted to say. Thank you, and I appreciate that point well taken. All right, I think that probably takes us to where we want to wrap things up. Um, should we do announcements first? Afterwards, okay, sounds good. Jackie. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and let all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinese Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Will song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. 
Manjushri, Master of Flawless Wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snow land sages. O Sanjata, I make requests at your holy feet. Okay, so announcements. Um, so uh, this is a very special week. Every week's actually special in my opinion. But this week we have a guest that's a good friend of ours. Geshe Sewan um, is going to be is teaching meditation and mantras on Wednesday at six o'clock. So that's uh, really a special, special evening. And um, he's also open to house blessings, personal interviews. And um, you can either um, email at info at lawrenceradomacenter.org or you can um, talk to me or I'm sure Susan. Um, just catch one of us and we'll put it on the list that I uh, to have an interview with Geshe Sewan. And then um, then beginning Thursday, um, he's going. There's going to be an opening ceremony here. Gosh, I don't have the schedule in front of me. Um, thinking it starts at 10, 10 a.m. I wonder if someone here might know that. But I'm going to wait for Susan because I'd like to say the right thing. Oh, that's right. That's correct. So, um, friends here, I'm helping with the schedule because it's four days and we need help. <laughs> but I want everyone in line to be aware. Thursday's a special day. Oh, thank you, Susan. Okay. So, uh, Thursday, we have 27 fifth graders coming at 1030, 1030 to 1130. So, it's going to be very, very lively here, and I love that. Um, we need their energy, don't we? Don't want just people with white hair like me. So um, and then later at 12, there's an opening ceremony. So maybe even if you're a worker, you could come over here at lunch for the opening ceremony. That's very special. And then um, he's going to be on, on the radio in KFBK at 2.45 in the morning. Um, at 2.45. So we invite you to listen to Geshe Sewing on the radio. and. Um, New station, Channel 13 said we might come here and we and learn to see the fifth graders. So um, so that's Thursday. Then Friday, 10 o'clock, uh, doing um, reciting Medicine Buddha, Sadhana, and continuing to create the Sand Mandala. And um, that's the day when he has set aside for personal interviews. But we can fit you in if that doesn't work for you on another day. Geshe Sewan, he loves to say yes. I, I've seen him over and over say, yes, I might say, and I know someone in his place, yes, yes, who is it? Who is it? I will help them. No worries. Tell them no worries. It's incredible. And then, um, let's see, and then on um, Saturday, continuing with the Sand Mandela, so that's wonderful for people that are workers like myself who can spend the day with him as they make the Sand Mandela together. It's going to be a medicine Buddha Mandela. And then on Sunday, the Medicine Buddha Empowerment at 11 a.m. And uh, quite a few of you have been contacted about that to be a helper. And uh, actually, we can't have too many helpers. Together, we can do something amazing. So those are all my announcements. Unless I'm going to ask, oh, there's a, a men's group today. And I, no? Yes, there's a men's group uh, that's meeting. Um, every other Sunday, there's a men's group that meets here. And it's just, uh, I see the people that go to it really enjoy each other's company and talk about Dharma principles. And I sometimes don't put it in the world, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. That just means I've been forgetful. So, okay, so that's our announcements. Yes, and it, yes okay. Oh, <laughs> 